So, um, we've all heard about immunology, the immune senescence. Um, so we've got some questions here um, for, for individuals, uh, speakers, um, which we'll get to. And by the way, we, we also want um, participation from yourself, particularly um, as many of you are vets and you've heard quite a lot from the human perspective. We'd like to hear from you what, what can, it, what in relationship in terms of what you see in companion animals and what can and how that can sort of uh, translate. But one question I'd like to ask all of you, and we've heard some of you touched on this idea of frailty, and it's just really interesting how much in relationship to, to immune senescence and frailty, is, is, are there any connections? Or Because I've heard people talk about frailty and its links with you know, pro-inflammatory cytokines. So I wonder if we could get your, your, your take on that, because I, I, I noticed yesterday in, in some of the talks that was mentioned um, with, 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 with animals, and I, I'd, I'd like to see what, what you guys think about that. Yeah, no, I mean, from my perspective, in terms of food intake, I think that's the main link for me. So uh, older adults who are frail may find it difficult either to access food, to go out and do their own shopping, to be able to eat it, to afford it, if they're on a, a limited income, uh, to be able to prepare it in the kitchen. And then there's also those interactions with psychology. So for example, a major risk factor in uh, older adults is a recent bereavement. So loss of a partner is very highly likely to lead to malnutrition as well. So I think for me, it's those kind of wider contexts which are driving that frailty, which then can be further exacerbated by a poor nutritional intake as well. Uh, so from my perspective, what we have seen in humans is that if, and some of the evidence that I've shown is that in frail or adults, so these are those, the way we classify that is based on their um, clinical frailty scores. So we have a lot of geriatricians we work with very closely to validate these different scores. What we have seen is individuals who are frailer show accelerated immune aging. Uh, the other, uh, the only evidence that I can think of, so this is all, as I said, it's just associative. The only evidence I can think of that's causal is a study that was published last year in which what they showed was that using a mouse model of T cell senescence. So these were young mice. If you induce T cell senescence, they start showing um, skeletal muscular aging and frailty-like symptoms. For example, the hand grip strength is reduced. So that's the only evidence that I can think of of a direct causal relationship between immune senescence and driving frailty. What was your thoughts, Graham? I think that uh, you had one of the answers there with gut permeability, mm -hmm. and that that could be something driving these effects on immunity. Whether it's senescence or not, it is an effect on immunity that might have negative consequences. One needs to demonstrate that that is the case. The thing about geriatric frailty is that it's very hard to define it because there are, it's a multiple choice question and there are many different indices mm. from the simple freed five uh, parameters, can you get out of your chair without falling over and so on, to the very complicated Rockwell with 40 different parameters, and it's, if you tick off five of them, you're frail, but you could tick off five different ones to the other guy who's frail, and those differences between these assessments of frailty haven't been compared or haven't really been studied. In our case, looking at the results with the influenza vaccination, there was another form of frailty index that showed a correlation with only the responses they showed to high-dose vaccination. Why the hell is that? the standard dose wasn't affected by that. So it's very complicated. It's going to be a lot of effort to dissect out what's going on. Probably not worth it for influenza vaccination because those vaccines are useless and will be replaced with RNA vaccines or other better vaccines as soon as possible. But the principle is going to remain the same, I think, that frailty impacts in some way, perhaps also via gut permeability as part of the reason, uh, on aspects of immune function that we have to define as we go along for each topic of clinical relevance, be it response to vaccines or some other clinical output, that has to be defined according to each circumstantial study. Okay, so I'm gonna take some questions, but guys, as I said, if there's any thoughts you'd like to, to make, um, we, we really wanna make this as interactive as possible. But, but a, a question um, which um, perhaps the Microbiome folks can, can comment on. There's a lot of questions. 
and I'll, I'll take a couple and get your thoughts. Uh, so, so I don't know. This one's not addressed to anyone, but I think both of you might want to give your, your thoughts. So, what can be added to the diet to increase the amount of beneficial bacteria in, in the gut uh, of the elderly? Yeah. So, you can either provide the bacteria directly. So there are commercially available supplements of probiotics now. There's also a, a great deal of interest in fermented food. And so Paul Cotter in uh, Ireland is do doing a lot of work in that area about whether there should be specific recommendations for fermented foods like cheese, yogurts, pickles, for example. So those are some aspects. But the other is the fibers that those bacteria particularly thrive upon. So again, you can buy prebiotic supplements, but also these are fibers found most commonly in fruits and vegetable fibers as well. So many of the supplements we have are, for example, extracts from some plant uh, waste materials. So for example, corn cob husks or uh, I've seen mango skins being processed into those, which is good for sustainability and using everything as well we can, but we can also consume some of those directly in foods that we eat. So onions, garlic, for example, are sources of prebiotics. So I think in terms of incorporating in an older person's diet, it's yeah. going to depend whether we're talking about someone who is particularly frail. And so supplementation with a drink may be the most straightforward option, particularly if they have difficulties with swallowing, for example. If we're talking about someone living in the community, then it's the kind of standard healthy living advice that we have about eating plenty of fruits and vegetables and a variety of them as well. And so partly related to that, Dr. Dougal, one of the questions relates to what you just demonstrated as intestinal permeability. So a supplementary question, and there's no pun intended when I say supplementary, is what, what, what do you think, are there any sort of nutrients that can sort of impact um, both positive or negative in terms of um, intestinal permeability? Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, they definitely are. So the key ones, the two key, three, or three key ones that came up were firstly the dietary fibers that are positive and your polyunsaturated fatty acids, but the other ones was the cholesterol intake, saturated fatty acids. Uh, the other thing that we need to think about is, of course, your micro, the probiotics and the prebiotics are another key one. Uh, the evidence regarding there is a bit uh, controversial because we are still not, uh, most of the prebiotics or probiotics out there are relying on two bacteria species, either the bacterioids or the lactobacilli, and we've never gone beyond that. And when we did our dissection of the bacteria species that could actually be contributing towards the gut leakage, we have identified a, a lot more new targets that we are now validating. So what we need to possibly go beyond is the usual rec uh, probiotics that are available in the supermarkets because there's a lot of negative evidence suggesting that they don't really have a beneficial effect and that could either be down to the amounts of microbiome actually composition in there uh, or the other thing is the duration that you've had it because there are a lot of unknowns there. So here's a question for all, all, all three of you and then we're going to open it up to the floor. Uh, and this was quite a popular question uh, and this is something I, I've heard even, uh, you know, vets talk about. Is, is there any beneficial, is there any benefit in terms of intermittent fasting? Oh uh, uh, yeah, no. the, Yeah, I mean that's, uh, yeah. people have been talking about this. So, so what's your thoughts? And I think Graham, you, do you have some data on that as well? Let, let's hear what you guys think. Yeah, no, I mean, I was very interested yesterday hearing about the patterns of animal feeding and the effects that that had upon health. Um, in human health, there's a great deal of interest in chronobiology or those circadian cycles that we have. I have colleagues who have induced that in laboratory models and found that they can induce obesity by disrupting the sleep cycles of mice without you know, and so perhaps that's what's happening to all of us with the blue light exposure that we get. You know, perhaps that's something happening to us. There are colleagues who are doing these kind of intermittent fasting protocols. Um, and I think in terms of human weight loss, it's yeah. a controversial area. But in terms of the biology, I think it's, you know, for eating food is an inflammatory challenge, right? I, I, one of the model systems I did was giving people a high fat meal and then following them up over six hours. So they got to eat two croissants and a delicious milkshake made of double cream. And then their inflammatory markers spike after that. So when we eat a meal, that is a challenge to us. Um, and so fasting may reduce the frequency of those challenges that we have. But I think in terms of human health, it's very 
and, and, and I'm sure companion animal health, it's very complicated because people who can do that have a certain lifestyle, right? People who can have one meal a day and perhaps have an office job where they can be grumpy at other people for the rest of the day can do that in a way that someone who's doing a manual occupation or a customer service facing occupation where they have to be pleasant all the time might find it easier to do with regular meals. Yeah. Does anyone else want to add anything to that? I just want to ask, when you say inflammatory markers peaked, were the anti-inflammatory markers also peaking? Because most people study only the pro-inflammatory and tend to yeah. leave out the other half of the equation and get a wrong idea from that. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're right. It's, it's that kind of ratio, right? But I think it's definitely immunostimulatory, let's say. I can't remember the ratios offhand, but I think the study we were doing was looking at uh, obese adults versus adults of a healthy weight, and the yeah. picture was bleaker, let's say, for those who were living with obesity. I think it just stresses how one has to be careful in describing exactly what's being measured under which circumstances and what that might mean. Mm. Uh, mostly it's predicting what it might mean rather than actually measuring what it does mean. And so it's just a word of caution in my devil's advocate position here that things are not really as simple as may often be the impression given. Because these are, this is the way science works. You yeah. establish, you get some data and establish a paradigm that explains your data and predicts what's going to happen next. And then what happened next, what happens next is often consistent with that, and so that strengthens the paradigm. Ten years later, people have forgotten that it's only a model. And yeah. when data appear, this is the old-fashioned science philosophy of Thomas Kuhn who, uh, and, and Pop Pepper, Popper, mm. who uh, say that you, know, you have a fixed idea about something. It's very hard then to incorporate data into that model which don't directly fit until you have an accumulation of so much that it overwhelms the old hypothesis. Mm. So we mustn't let ourselves get into that position, I think, so that, you know, we don't want to have to change the paradigm. We want to keep our paradigms yeah. and make sure they're correct. Uh, good, good point. So are there, are, do we have any questions? I don't know, is there a mic floating around? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thanks for an excellent presentation yesterday over dinner. You thought it wasn't going to be of any interest to us. I think it has been. But I've got a question actually for Graham and Caroline. Um, Graham, you mentioned that uh, with increasing age, the ability to mount a, a vaccine response is reduced, and, partic and particularly you mentioned cell mediated immunity. Now, uh, in the UK, we've got endemic leptospirosis, and the vaccine for that works through stimulating cell mediated immunity. Uh, and it's also a very short-acting vaccine. We have to do it every 12 months. So do you think we should be looking at uh, either increasing the antigen load in those vaccines, if, if that will work, or increasing the frequency of vaccine to make sure our elderly population remain protected? And the second question for Caroline really is, uh, is there anything we can actually do practically nutritionally to improve that immune response? For example, I don't know, uh, arginine supplementation or something. But is there anything you can think of which might benefit those older animals which are struggling with their immune response? Well, I think most vaccines are suboptimal. And thus far, the, the cautious way of trying to improve them is to double the vaccine dose or to increase the amount of antigen there. So yes, that would be one way to to think about it, to use adjuvants, which are often not used in licensed vaccines, but require a lot of testing, of course, to make sure that this is safe, but that's something that might, in fact, then be uh, no longer necessary by improving the vaccine. So as we know, as I showed you from the uh, VZV reactivation, those memory cells are still there, but they are blocked. That can be, that they can be rejuvenated, so to say by a, a vaccine which is better than the, the previous one. So I don't know exactly which vaccine is used in the instance that you just mentioned, but I imagine it's not an RNA vaccine or it's, not a, it's, a, it's a protein vaccine, I believe. And therefore, it probably could easily be improved to um, reduce the frequency with which it has to be used in older people. Yeah, and in terms of specific supplements, there is uh, 
some comparators I might draw with human health. So, for example, the current kind of genome profiling work that we can do can identify people who have particular metabolic disorders and that those can be rectified through dietary interventions. So people with profound allergic disease, for example, have been identified to have a problem with glutamate metabolism and providing that to them directly can reverse some of those allergy symptoms. So there could be some aspects of personalized nutrition if we can identify what someone is deficient in or has some other metabolic processes which are limiting. But I guess the parallel that comes most to mind is the concept in human health of prehabilitation. So people who are going to undergo surgery or chemotherapy, for example, there's a growing movement of making sure that people on entry to that are in the best physical condition that they can be. And that may be through dietary advice, it may be through exercise and muscle strengthening programs. And so I could imagine something similar for older, ad older animals as well. So um, uh, broadly, it comes down to the, the standard advice we're giving, right? Exercise is good, healthy diet, avoiding snacks, you know, avoiding obesity, for example. But perhaps we can help people with the focus of the importance of that by talking about this is what's going to give you or your animal the best chance of having a good response in this situation. So if any of us were undergoing surgery, we may be motivated to try and ensure that we have the best possible outcome by being as healthy as we can going into it. And improve the vaccine so you don't need to bother with all that. In terms of relationship to vaccine, and I, I, I don't really know what happens in the uh, veterinary profession in terms of uh, clinical trials, but am I right in, in humans? In most clinical trials, vaccination is done on young people, relatively, isn't it? So I think some organizations are now considering, um, and I believe that was the case with the COVID vaccines, they did clinical trials, not just on young people, but they also did it on uh, people from different ages. Is, is that something you've At first they were only in young, because you don't want to risk it in older people. Yeah. Quite rapidly after that, because everything was moving so fast, older people were included. But the first studies showing efficacy and safety mm -hmm. were only in young, yeah. as is standard practice. Yeah. So, so is there a possibility? Is that the same in the veterinary profession? You, with um, vaccines, are they initially trialled on younger dogs or younger cats, or is it just across all age range? Very strongly tested because obviously we vaccinate very early to get protection on board. Yeah. So, you know, 12, 10 weeks of age and even six weeks of age. So they are thoroughly tested before they go into the marketplace. Uh, and the answer to the question is the, uh, the leptospirosis vaccine currently in the UK, the one that's mainly used is, contains four different bacteria and it is a killed vaccine and it is adjuvanted to try and improve uh, uh, response. So. Okay. No, f thank you. So, so uh, another question. Um, uh, this is to you, uh, Dr. Charles. Uh, we don't not we don't what is it? Let's have a look. My my glasses. I definitely need new glasses. We don't have a lot of data on the form of omega-3 fatty acid and absorption on efficacy in dogs and cats. Would you be able to offer perspective on what has been found in humans? Yeah, so in human studies, you can do a study of providing the dietary sources, so providing something like salmon, um, or you can provide capsules, which may allow you to do a, a higher dose. Some people wish to have, for example, a vegan alternative, so there are kind of algae alternatives to those supplements as well. In terms of the form, that some of my colleagues have done research on, for example, there are genetically modified crops which can be enriched in these fatty acids, and they were compared to fish consumption and found that that didn't affect any absorption. Uh, the, the packaging and organization of those fatty acids, whether they're in triglycerides or phospholipids, all of those things have been assessed. Um, and so I think broadly, humans, we are quite good at absorbing those should we need to. I think the exceptions are, for example, conditions such as pancreatitis or uh, other conditions that affect gut mucus consistency. So cystic fibrosis in humans is the example I'm thinking of that reduces fat absorption. That may mean that you wish to incorporate something else in the, the fatty meal as well. So they may also need some digestive enzyme support, for example, to be able to make full use of that. I think, does that? Yeah, I, I think so. 
So, so, Graham, there's a question for you. Um, so, and this is quite an interesting one, because you talked about inflammation and vaccination. So the question relates, given the importance of inflammatory responses to vaccination, would it be beneficial to limit anti-inflammatory supplements modification around the time of vaccination? Would, would this help provide a better antibody response in older individuals? Well, that's possible, I suppose, but one other way of doing it is if you believe that the pro-inflammatory mediators are unlikely to be sufficient, you can put them in mm. as a part of the adjuvant, it's what adjuvants, or adjuvants do to help also stimulate uh, the innate immune system by creating an irritation and generating an inflammatory response. You want a local limited inflammatory response, not a long-standing chronic systemic inflammatory response. So the fact that there was a correlation in our influenza vaccine studies with better responses in older people getting the high dose vaccine with those who had higher levels of what you might call inflammaging was maybe a kind of epiphenomenon reflecting the fact that they were just able to do that for whatever reason uh, locally, whereas other people had a lower uh, such response. Rather similar to the um, protective effect of pro-inflammatory secreting CMV-specific CTLs in older people who survived longer than people who had um, a dampened pro-inflammatory response against the same uh, virus. So when you're older, or if you're being protected against a, a pathogen, or if you need to stop CMV reactivating when you're older, then having a limited and local pro-inflammatory response is what you need in order to be able to overcome and uh, reverse the problem by the new, um, the new pathogen or the reactivated old pathogen. Not to do well, you're shaking your head. I, I wonder in your immune aging study where you've done uh, uh, fecal transplant, are, what are the markers that you are seeing? Does, does that relate to pro-inflammation? Yes, that does. So uh, the other thing, the reason I was shaking my head was that we do need that inflammatory response, but not prolonged. So the reason why the microbial translocation is bad, it's almost going to trigger it, but it's prolonged. Had it only occurred for a short time, it's beneficial. So that's the thing that we need to always remember. Right. Um, with our, in our FMT ones, we did see a state of activation. Yeah. So that could be dampened. So this prolonged activation. So the hypothesis that we have that how it's causing senescence is this prolonged activation, this prolonged indu induction of proliferation, which is bad. And that's how it's having an effect. And we did see that with the FMT as well, that it could dampen that by having less of these microbial products or activation inducing potential metabolites in there that are there persistently. That's what we want to stop. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to... Uh, but th there is also a mouse model for influenza vaccination, yeah. which did uh, inject IL-6 and other pro-inflammatory factors at the same time as the vaccine. And that improved, that was local and limited because it was just injected along with the vaccine. So that was the, uh, the way of increasing the, um, the uh, influenza vaccine response in older mice. Nobody tried that in humans because, yes, yes, yes. well, nobody's, as far as I know, nobody tried that in humans no, no, no. or dogs or cats. I see there's a hand up at the back. Thanks. I have a follow-up question for Dr. Childs. Um, so again, as a veterinary nutritionist, not knowing anything about human requirements, dogs and cats have different omega-6 fatty acid requirements and only conditional EPA DHA requirements for growth. But we do often look at the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3s in the diet. And I'm curious if you either look at that and or if there are specific ratios that you target for specific disease processes. Yeah, thank you. Good, good question. Um, so in and I, I'm not familiar with the uh, companion animal metabolism of those fatty acids, but in, in human health, uh, most of us are eating much more omega-6 than omega-3, at least 10 to 1 odds there. Um, but omega-3 fatty acids will become specifically enriched in target organs that they're required. So in terms of human health, I think of the eye and the brain, for example. And so that, that's where those uh, health claims on products for infants come from, promoting brain and eye development. Um, so I think one of the challenges is that in doing a blood sample, we're not accessing that. And so 
we may underestimate, I guess, the role of those omega-3 fatty acids, whereas in tissue samples, perhaps we see very specific enrichment happening there. So um, I think I, I can't advise on companion animal intakes, but in human health, we tend to see a ratio of 10 to 1, but perhaps we might prefer a lower ratio than that. Okay, a, a question. I want to ask these guys a question about antibody levels. So and then we're going to... Do, do you want to come back on, on that? Yeah, um, so yeah. just to follow up. So 10 to 1 would be kind of a, a low, incredibly low good ratio for a lot of our pets. I'm talking mostly about looking at, I guess, home-cooked diets because pet food companies can supplement omega-3s in their diets. Not all diets do have them, and there's a huge range of EPA, DHA in various diets, ranging from, like six milligrams per 100 calories up to over 400 per 100 calories. Um, but there's, there's this maximum that we're supposed to um, have in a diet. I don't know that all companies adhere to it, even though it's out there for our dog and cat requirements. So there's been debate in like dermatology and gastroenterology, you know, should you aim for a certain ratio to be below this, to be an, quote, anti-inflammatory diet. So if you're saying 10 to 1 is your starting point, you're doing way better than we are. Um, but that's, I guess, are there different, or is there any evidence to support aiming for a specific ratio? I think I don't know of evidence for a specific Not dogs ratio. and cats, even. Um, but I think something... Uh, Something which came to mind, which is of interest, is, is we have the same variability in human supplementation. You know, you can go to the supermarket and buy an omega-3 supplement, and it varies a great deal in terms of the content that's contained within that. And then it's thinking about whether we're talking pharmacologically, or are we talking about a dietary a potential dietary possibility. One thing I think we should be aware of is that those long chain omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids are very prone to oxidative damage. And so I think that's possibly the logic why there's an upper limit because we may be increasing the risk of oxidative stress and potential oxidative damage uh, from very high. I think in the early days of omega-3 supplementation, that was one of the challenges that was found in animal models. And so having good antioxidant intakes alongside them is probably important. Okay, so um, I'm gonna ask these individuals and then we're gonna come back to the audience. Um, so you all describe different immunological measurements and parameters. Uh, and this is a question about antibody. So determining the antibody titer is something uh, advocated in dogs and cats and companion animals to determine if Revaccination is needed, it's necessary. So the question relates, do you agree with this approach? Uh, does the titer tell us, the level of titer, does it tell us something about the level of protection? And does that mean therefore, if the titer goes down, does that mean the need for yearly vaccination? So one, antibody titer, because we all use that. Everybody, you know, you talk immunologically, we talk about antibody titer. So if the antibody titer falls, does that we need to have, you know, yearly boost? <laughs> well, it depends whether you have memory cells kept in the bone marrow, whether you need a yearly boost. The yearly boost is not necessary if the uh, re-exposure to the pathogen stimulates the natural memory for the memory B cells in the bone marrow. Yeah. And that may or may not be the case according to the nature of the pathogen or if it's flu, the seasonal variant and the distribution of those seasonal variants at the time. That's why it's complicated to analyze. But of course, yes, a high antibody titer uh, against influenza, for example, is necessary in order to have the, the vaccine licensed. But the titers are only surrogates for protection. Mm -hmm. Initially, studies were done which correlated a certain antibody titer with protection, the WHO has rules about this. So there are three ways of measuring a positive response. Either you have to increase it by a certain amount or a certain proportion or whatever. So if you have an older person, for example, already has a high titer of antibody because of previous exposures, then the vaccine that doesn't stimulate that too much further, will be, that person will be considered a non-responder. But that would be erroneous because the, they'll still have a level of antibody sufficient, theoretically, to protect them against exposure. So the antibody is only protecting you against infection by a new uh, exposure. 
So sterilizing immunity. What you need, of course, are the T cells to deal with the sneak through that is, of the pathogen that escapes the sterilizing immunity of the antibody. That's why it's so important to have a T cell and a B cell response. So it's not just the antibody titer that should be measured, but is the only thing is measured because it's standardized and easy. One should measure the T cell responses as well. That was done, of course, in the COVID uh, studies due to the uh, extreme emergency nature of, of that uh, episode, but it isn't, isn't part of a standardized um, vaccine licensing program, still not, because it's too complicated to do it. So experimentally done. Okay. Do you guys have any thoughts on that in terms of antibody titer? Yeah, I, I would agree with that, that what we have just done a pilot study in old rattles where we were comparing vaccine titers with our immune aid score and microbiome features. And you've seen very, uh, I, I, we see that as well, where a lot of them, because they're healthy, they already have very high titers and post the vaccination dose. It's a four, we're not seeing a fourfold or twofold increase, and that's where it's very difficult to classify them either as non responders or they already have high levels. And these are, and then when we have looked at the immunological profile, we have seen that that's a really good predictor as well. And now what we're trying to do is actually get information on how much, how many infections or episodes of F infections that they have to see if that could really help predict that. Okay, Graham, you want to? Uh, I just want to say else? that, of course, what you should do is measure the efficacy of your vaccine in actual protection terms, clinical protection. Yeah. Uh, but that is way outside of any standardized procedure because you'd have to survey a large number of individuals who were vaccinated. You'd have to then actually check that they did have laboratory confirmed infection by the agent that you're trying to vaccinate against, yeah. which is difficult to do. It's just, it's just not practical. Yeah. So you have the surrogate antibody response, antibody titer is the best you can do it quite easily. Okay. Yeah, well, back to the floor. And we've got, okay. Hi, um, Dr. Childs and Dr. Duger both mentioned short-chain fatty acids. And, and so I was, so why does the immune system need to know about fatty acid, short-chain fatty acid concentration in the gut? I guess it's it's an interesting question about that kind of needs to know, right? And then we don't fully understand the the mechanisms there. Is this a happy accident, right? That our gut bacteria have colonized us in a way that provides energy to our local gut epithelium, some of which then transfers across into our bloodstream and has downstream effects. Or is this something that in perhaps the early days of life where we have this leakier gut, this is part of the education and priming of our immune system to those exposures that we're going to have. So I think we don't know the answer why it does that. I think we just know that that happens and that it's something that we could modify through diet. So I think, I, think I'd, I don't know the answer to why our immune cells would need to do that, but they have evolved and learned to respond to that because that is something in our gut environment, I think. If I could just add to that, that it's not only in the gut environment, that's one of the links that we have that it's even found in circulation. So we even measured these in circulation and compared levels. Of course, it's less than the, than the gut, but what, the way we look at it is it's almost like a signaling molecule that it can transfer from your gut go to the, because that's what in humans we're relying on systemic immunity. And this is helping us dissect those interactions, that it's migrated them and directly having an effect. Whereas if we think about the microbiome itself, you wouldn't find the bacterial species going and uh, impacting your systemic immunity, for example. So it's a nice, almost like a communication signal. Mm. Although I think there is, sorry, I was just gonna say, I think there is some, that translocation is, is a interesting and slightly controversial area, isn't it? But I think people have shown that an oral probiotic supplement can be detected in human breast milk, for example. So that suggests some degree of translocation through the gut and how, how that happens is very interesting. But um, sorry, just to come back to Dr. Dugan. So um, you, you're saying that it's the metabolite itself, the short chain fatty acid, that's making it to the periphery and, and signaling to the whole body systemically. And so why does the whole body need to know the concentration of short fatty acid, short chain fatty acid in the gut. 
so it's not a question of needing to know. It's more of a question of it exerting a direct impact. So that's where we have the direct evidence that we have, for example, if you look at our immune cells, they express the GPCR receptors that can directly bind to these metabolites. And uh, what we have now is evidence of how it can actually induce metabolic changes and directly impact it. So that's the direct evidence that we have. It doesn't need to know it, but it's there and it's exerting an effect. So that's what we have seen. So it's the balance that's really important. Um, just, to, just to follow up on that, seeing it, if I understand it, I mean, it's an impact, but is it, do you suspect that it's more for sort of bioenergetic uh, um, understanding of the periphery of what metabolites are available? Or is this some sort of pathological idea that if short chain fatty acids are high, then that might be a signal that it's something dangerous. So which do you uh, favor? Yeah, I mean, I suppose if I, if I thought in evolutionary terms, so some short chain fatty acids are anti-inflammatory. So if you have a bacteria that's producing lots of acetate, some of which is leaking across, and that is anti-inflammatory, that may allow the survival <laughs> of those bacteria which are producing it. So I could imagine a kind of evolutionary chain driving that production to continue. But I think the other thing I was going to comment is that we understand short-chain fatty acids, acetate, butyrate, propionate. These are by far not the only signaling molecules and metabolites from our gut microbiome. We just don't know about all the other ones. And we're only just starting to understand there are, I think yesterday we saw a presentation talking about neurotransmitter production in the gut. For me, you know, if you are someone who eats soya, you will have different metabolites from your gut bacteria than someone who doesn't, you know, and what, what does that mean for human health and how, why do my immune cells have a receptor for an amino acid found in porcini mushrooms? I don't know why, but they do. And is it a mistake that it just happens to be similar to something else that's detecting or is this some kind of evolutionary history of the exposures that we've had. I, I absolutely agree that there are metabolites beyond this. So our microbiome can also convert these uh, primary bile acids that we have into secondary bile acids. And that's another interesting emerging target because we know they can directly impact your systemic immunity as well. So there are lots of them beyond the short chain fatty acids. So I think there's a couple of questions. At, there's someone at the back, but in just, just one point, with, with metabolites, and there's some recent papers that's just come out in immunity to show that some of the metabolites are actually having an effect on in intestinal cells. They're actually now secreting um, uh, factors that are involved in hematopoiesis of, um, of, of immune cells. It's becoming increasingly complicated. So there's a paper recently come up by Skinner et al., literally this week in a mouse model where they're treated with uh, low fiber and high fiber. And this is related to severe uh, 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 inflammatory disorders in the lung, looking at neonatal mice and showing its impact on probionate and butyrate. So it, it's, oh, it's, it's becoming both interesting but incredibly complicated. The other issue um, and people have known this for a while, but people are really looking at this, is that um, white blood cells seem to express uh, um, receptors to neurotransmitters. So, they, so uh, T cells have been shown to express receptors of somatostatin, VIP, etc. Substance P, for example. So it's, it, it, <laughs> it's really difficult. So there's, you know, the idea of the, the, this crosstalk between the gut, the neurosystem, and, and, and the immune system, and it's becoming interesting, but also incredibly complicated. There is a couple, I think there's a question at the back, and then we'll, we'll take one or two more as we're coming close to the end. Yeah. Hi, it's a question for Dr. Dougal. Um, intrigued by the heterogeneity of your responses in the groups. Um, and especially on, on the barrier function. And so, at least from the IBD perspective or the inflammation, there's, there's um, polymorphisms in the genes associated with autophagy, ER stress, mitochondrial function. And, and so, you said there was an effect on autophagy and things there. Have you been able to dissect that further? And Luke, is it you know, related to SNPs within those pathways that you've got a group where things that are involved in barrier restitution are predisposing them? 
Yes, so the way we are trying to actually dissect those is using in vitro culture models. And again, that's where it gets very complicated. In our initial analysis, we shortlisted about 30 metabolites of interest, which were linking with the immune parameters. And what's interesting is they all have different effects. So for example, the one example I gave in today's talk, the way it's possibly acting is via uh, boosting the mitochondria potential. But that one had no effect on the autophagy processes. And we've identified three metabolites that are actually boosting this autophagy processes. And it gets more complicated now. We've got some that are boosting the mitophagy processes. So this is the mitochondrial ability to clear it out. So it's, they're all acting via different pathways. It's not one way. And that's why we were looking at a number of different ones. And do you have anything on ER stress involved with that, the misfolded protein accumulations and you know, mucus barrier degrading? That's one of the things we haven't actually looked at. At the moment, the key focus has been the mitochondria, autophagy processes, and cellular senescence, but that's something we're starting to look into now. I think there's a question. Someone's got their hand up. And then we've got another question here. Shall yeah. I go? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yes, please. Uh, actually, my question is to you. Um, oh. I, uh, I'm intrigued by your hypothesis that the rate of thymic involution may be responsible for the sex difference in longevity between men and women. Um, I, my, my question that comes from that, uh, well, that observational work in, in mice, right, um, is has that been shown in any other species that there's that uh, uh, sex difference in the rate of thymic involution? And not necessarily just to you, but to anyone in the audience, have we been able to show a sex difference in longevity in any other species, because I don't know that that's documented in the dog or the cat, for example. Um, so I just throw that out as a question, whether or not we actually have documented that difference in other species. So in terms of um, the, the point I made, that's been, in, in, that's been shown for trick levels. So to look at T-cell output, um, uh, a number of groups have, have, have shown that, that the level of TREX, um, you can still find them present in older females in comparison to the same age as, as men. It's speculation whether that is related to um, the, uh, longevity. Um, but, but what has been shown, and again, it's, st it's, it's still, I think the challenge, it's, 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 a, it's a relationship, but there have been studies in mice that might suggest that. So, um, studies have shown that um, in mice that undergo calorie restriction, you see a delay in, 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 in phymic involution. But also, if you accelerate phymic involution, they'll become short-lived. So, people have done this by manipulating, for example, FOXN1, uh, which will reduce um, phymic activity. So, the there is some relationship to that. Um, but in humans, I think it's just mostly a, a, a correlation. And so we, using that indirect evidence of, of thymic involution with TREK markers, has that been applied to your knowledge in other species to look and see if that uh, sex difference holds in other species? I guess the problem is, is that um, the studies we've done, we've just done in, in dogs, I, I, I'm not sure if people have done that in primates. The problem is, is, is that the TREC assay um, has only been done in dogs because it's based on genome sequencing. So I don't think it's been done in the cat. I don't think it's been done in the horse or other species. So, and the problem um, is obviously having that genetical data and equally for companion animals. Um, there aren't any antibodies to identify the different subsets of, of white blood cells. But that's something I'm sure uh, people will, will, will want to do. Um, I don't know in any of your studies, have you guys seen any sex differences? Uh, we've, we've only done it on maybe cohorts of 50 or 60 old rattles, which isn't at times enough. We did try and tease this out, yeah. but it wasn't enough to make a very conclusive statement. And I'm not aware of any literature that's actually found similar. Yeah, no, I mean, in terms of 
human data, my understanding is some of the sex differences in life expectations are the differences in risk-taking behaviour as well between males and females. So males are much more likely to die in their 20s in an unfortunate accident compared to females. Yeah, I, I didn't really want to go in that direction. I was, I was worried. <laughs> um, I think there was a question. Yeah. yeah. My question is related to... If you have any comments on the potential role of tryptophan in this complicated mix of what's going on in the gut, we see a lot of chronic enteropathies in dogs, especially in cats, and that's been associated with subnormal serum tryptophan concentrations, and microbial metabolites of tryptophan appear to be important in maintaining normal barrier function, gut permeability, and canurinin is one of the mammalian metabolites of tryptophan that's associated with inflammation, and even depression and neurological abnormalities. It's kind of a, a very curious, almost potential s s uh, role for explaining a lot of things, but how does it fit into the complicated mix that you've talked about this morning? Uh, so it, it, there's a lot of evidence on how it could have, it's one of the parts of the gut-brain axis, but in our own work, we haven't found any evidence of it exerting much of an immunomodulatory effect, I'm afraid, but this is only in humans, so we haven't seen, it's not one of the key ones that we are possibly working on. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I don't have any uh, additional information to share on that, but I mean, I agree. I think we're, we're at the stage now where the kind of metabolomic data we can access is revealing a lot more of these things, and so we, we really are just at the beginnings of understanding all these potential links. But I think, as you say, the, the, those kind of gut-brain interactions are something in terms of mental health that, that many of us are also interested in in the nutrition space. Okay, uh, I'm gonna, if there are no more questions, I'm gonna ask um, my presenters one last question. So the, the title of, of this session is called Immune Senescence. And senescence obviously relates to um, the fact that uh, cells have stopped dividing or, or, or cease. And, but you're all showing data in a certain way that actually um, immune cells can actually either be the term rejuvenated or actually they're not as senescent as we think. So I'd like to get your take on that. On, on that comment, maybe immune senescence may not be the right term um, because of the fact that we can see with COVID, older folks can mount an immune response um, and the impact of diet seems to be, modulate you know, immunity. So I'd, I'd like to get your take on, on, on that. No, that's a really interesting question and I guess that re reveals a little bit to us that aging is not just the total absence of immune function, right? Is it a movement towards alternative pathways? You know, if, if someone has chemotherapy and has no immune function, they have very different outcomes than the, what we see with aging, for example. And so I think, I think you're right. I think we're just, we don't fully understand those processes, but it's not as simple as just things being turned off, right? There, there's something more happening than that. So I think that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, Dr. Dingle. If I might add to that, then, so it's the other examples we see, and that's why I was giving the examples of our healthy older cohorts, is at times not everyone is on that same trajectory, and it's very difficult to tease out those differences. You might have a very healthy older adult who's actually not showing a lot of these features, and we have worked with cohorts of biologically young individuals. So we just published a paper last year on trauma cohorts. And what you see there are they are 30 year olds, but on a very accelerated immune aging trajectory as well. So there are a lot of factors that could actually influence these processes. And the other thing is, I would definitely agree that it's malleable to some extent. Mm. There is building up evidence suggesting that even the state of senescence might not be permanent. So that's why I'm not, I agree that I don't know if we can really call them senescent. Mm. They do have this SASP phenotype, I agree with, but that has been shown to be possibly we can reverse this. Graham, your, your final thoughts. I think immunosenescence is an extremely bad term that should not be used at all <laughs> unless you can show that it lives up to its name. Senescence means something bad when you're old. And in most cases, actually, the term immunosenescence was introduced in the 1970s in a very simplistic way as a shorthand, and it's been embedded in people's minds. And I wouldn't like the 
audience to have the impression that we know what a senescent T cell is. We might know what a senescent fibroblast is. That's one that doesn't reproliferate. Yeah. That's not the case with T cells. The T cells that are end stage differentiated, which I always refer to as some of them possibly being senescent, one of the difficulties is that we do not have any markers for senescence. There's DNA damage, which might help to identify such cells. There's this, as I mentioned, this strange variant of galactosidase that seems to pop up with nobody knowing why in senescent, in replicatively senescent fibroblasts, but is also in T cells. And there are markers that are commonly used, like the loss of CD28, which is not a marker of senescence, but is a regular uh, event that happens when T cells are stimulated uh, via the T cell receptor and CD28. CD28 is downregulated as part of the physiolog physiological process. And late stage differentiated T cells that are CD28 negative uh, can become CD28 positive again uh, if you take away the TNF that they're bathed in in older individuals who have infant aging. So you can get CD28 back onto your T cells if you block TNF signaling. And other markers like CD57 and KLRG1, you could make a cluster of all these markers together which might indicate that you have a cell, the chance of which being senescent is higher. But there's no way of saying this is a senescent T cell. You can't say for sure, because we do not have any specific markers, that this is a senescent T cell. And I really believe that it's not a good idea to refer in one's work to cells that are senescent on the basis of these few markers, even if you do multiple markers, because we should limit ourselves to describing what we know is the case, that there are alterations to the phenotype that indicate a differentiation pathway towards end-stage differentiation, towards something that might be senescent. And to use those, these are peripheral blood biomarkers normally. You don't get many cells from humans that are not in the peripheral blood. Always very hard to get, so almost all these studies are done on PBMC, so only the mononuclear cells as well. The neutrophils you can, of course, do, but it's very difficult because you can't freeze them. <coughs> so we're missing out. We're only looking at selected biomarkers, and they're only relevant if you can say that they really have a close correlation with a clinical outcome. This is why Shai's immune age uh, algorithm, alchemical algorithm, that hardly anybody understands how it works, is a useful uh, ability to define a much larger group of trajectories towards an aging phenotype, not a single phenotype itself. That's probably difficult to explain uh, here. But you did a great job using it as a single marker of not senescence, but of something that does correlate with uh, poor clinical outcome in many different cohorts, like the Framing the Heart Study and others. So I think we should limit ourselves to those kinds of markers that we know do have a clinical relevance and not and try to get away from saying that results in a senescent cell yeah. because you know that I think that's um, directs your thoughts in the wrong in the wrong direction. Yeah, it's primarily remodeling of the immune system with age. Um, so um, that brings us quite nicely to the end of this session. So again, I'd like to uh, thank the organisers. I, I really would like to to, to thank the speakers. Um, I you know. I asked them to, to be at this session, and they all kindly said yes. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful. Uh, and also, again, for all of you for your questioning and for listening. Uh, thank you all again. Um, have lunch. Uh, and then the next session um, uh, will be about the mitochondria and the amazing Professor Mika Campanella. Thank you very much.